Uh, so good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of our um, International Media and Communications Day Conference. Um, really interesting for today. Um, I hope you all found something that you uh, will get your feet stuck into in, in either in the discussions or in the debate around the various uh, presentations and uh, plenaries. Um, this morning, we're starting with a plenary from uh, Dr. Gavin Tickley, who's a senior lecturer at the Department of Media Studies at Manus University. Um, Gavin uh, is a very established uh, researcher in, in the area of media studies. He's uh, been at Manus University since 2005. Uh, his research interests there include uh, the politics of race, racism, and multiculturalism in European politics, uh, freedom of speech, and ideas of hate speech in digital media environments. Uh, the future of public service media and the integration of social theory uh, to media theory. Uh, his past books include uh, The Crisis of Multiculturalism, Racism in a Neoliberal Age, uh, written with Alana uh, Lebrun, uh, Z Books 2011, and the co edited National Conversations, Cultural Diversity and Public Service Media from Intellect Books in 2014. And after Charlie Yeppel, uh, Terror, Racism, Free Speech, uh, again, Dead Books in 2017. And most recently, Racism and Media, Play Publications uh, in 2019. And Is Free Speech Racist uh, in Summer 2020 by Politics Press in the Debating uh, Race Series. Uh, he's a docent in Media and Communications at the Swedish School of Social Sciences at the University of Helsinki. Um, and he, uh, with Alana Littlenin, um, edited the book series uh, Challenging Media, sorry, Challenging Migration Studies. Um, and he occasionally writes for the UK uh, newspaper The Guardian. Gavin, um, Gavin today will speak on the topic of anxiety and noise in public culture, thinking, free speech, and abundant communication. Gavin, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can. I, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if coming in on Zoom first thing in the morning is the most energizing thing for everybody. Um, but we'll we'll see how we we do with that. I'm sorry that I can't be with you there in in person. Although I do appreciate that conferences work more and more as hybrid conferences in a kind of real and and meaningful way. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, I want to try, I suppose, in some ways to address um, the, the conference themes, but by cutting into them in terms of my own preoccupations and interests, which will hopefully uh, intersect with, with, with some of yours and what you've been talking about yesterday and, and later on today. And that is, I want to try to think about the notion or the meaning of free speech in a context where speech is, among other things, very, very free indeed, or at least let's say it's produced and circulated in historically unprecedented volumes and at great intensity. And of course, one of the things that does, as we know, is obscures both old and new inequalities in communication. Um, just let's see. I come at this, um, as Tom mentioned, I published a book uh, about two years ago, a short book called Is, is Free Speech Racist? Um, the answer is yes and no at the same time. But rather, the book was about the ways in which debates about freedom of speech and debates about what constitutes racism in the politics of racism and anti-racism um, have become very, very closely entwined with each other. So the book is out for about two years. It still has a bit of an afterlife, principally thanks to actors such as Fox News here, who last week were doing their best to drum up some new readers for me. So thank you, Fox News. Just wanted to celebrate that, share that moment with you this morning. But because of some of the questions that came up for me in writing this book in a very specific focus, um, I started to ask myself as a communications scholar, I suppose, with my slightly other hat on, some very basic questions about how we think about freedom of, of, of speech, which of course is such a central uh, value, such a loaded term in terms of how we think about democracy participation, the production of knowledge, all of these crucial areas of human endeavor. And so I started to ask myself, uh, I suppose, a kind of a deceptively straightforward question, which is, 
What does freedom of speech mean in contexts where noise or abundant communication is in some ways even freer? And it's some thoughts on this some kind of developing thoughts on this that I want to share with you this morning, which will hopefully connect with the with the themes of crisis and and change that you are looking at. If not, perhaps directly with the with the theme of disinformation, it will certainly, I think, intersect with some aspects of the conditions that enable disinformation. Um, perhaps in the ways that you have been discussing it. So let me try to open out some dimensions of what I want to look at this morning in relation to the appalling recent attack on Salman Rushdie, or more specifically aspects of the coverage of the attack on Salman Rushdie, um, where there was very obviously expressions, raw expressions of shock and horror and rage, and where very many media figures, media titles, politicians came out to, 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 to um, underline the need to defend freedom of speech, which in a liberal society must include the right to say offensive and upsetting things. So I think, you know, so far, nothing controversial there. But at the same time, multiple commentaries on the attack on Salman Rushdie, so much so that the New York Times ran a kind of commentary piece on this on August 15th. Many commentaries on the attacks connected what had happened to him to the contemporary debate over cancel culture. So the Financial Times, for example, had an op-ed that drew a kind of rhetorical line from the history of the fatwa issued against Salman Rushdie to the horrendous murder a few years ago by Saudi um, agents in Istanbul of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi to, to quote the Financial Times, the insidious effect of cancel culture on freedom of speech. Now, something odd is going on here. If we're linking death threats issued by authoritarian regimes, which are designed to lethally cancel artistic expression by murdering the artist, with this kind of ill-defined and undefinable media trope of cancel culture, which is something which means both too little and too much to be of any use to us analytically, other than maybe as a kind of a starting point for thinking about the ways in which a very sort of accelerated public culture brings different sorts of political, ethical and epistemological standpoints and viewpoints into collision with each other in, in somewhat unpredictable ways. But for me, the question is, how can these wildly different phenomena be connected to each other in this kind of seamless way in commentary on the attack uh, about the attack on, on Salman Rushdie? Now, I don't propose maybe to your relief or disappointment, I don't know, to spend any time talking about the idea of cancel culture this morning. Instead, I want to look at it as one dimension of a wider trend in public debates in contemporary liberal representative democracies, which is a trend to sort of declare freedom of speech in, in crisis. This often happens through, as we've seen, these, these invocations of an idea of cancel culture. But barely a day passes, particularly in the Anglophone world, without a kind of high profile claim that someone or something is being silenced. But of course, the immediate irony to this is that this silencing is, is voluble, it's loud in the contemporary media environment, even the possibility that something or somebody is being silenced generates a kind of a storm of digital noise. And what normally follows this is often a very predictable kind of debate about the limits of freedom of speech and who gets to decide them. And what I want to sort of pose as a question is how can such predictable disputes on the limits of speech take place in a context of apparently limitless speech? And in what ways should this give us some pause for, for thought? In other words, how can so many people claim to be silenced and loudly clamor for our attention at the same time? Now, of course, given the kinds of, 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 of media environment we're talking about, there's no shortage of meta commentary on this phenomenon. So Will Davies, for example, a few years ago in a long read in The Guardian, basically argued that sort of claims of being silenced, claims of one's free speech is being taken away from one, is a way of sort of claiming attention, making space in a very frenetic and highly competitive sort of public, public environment. So that the idea of free speech is being stretched, he argues, to the point where it starts to mean too much. And of course, that's a problem. If we want to defend free speech, we can't allow it to mean too little or too much at the same time. Similarly, in, in a response, much a more recent article, Pankai Mishra, in responding to the idea that you can draw a line from the fatwa against Salman Rushdie to the idea of 
cancel culture today says well look you know what's going on here really is in some ways a kind of a, a kicking back against the relativization of of cultural capital and expertise and public position so lots of kind of L, you know established columnists don't like the fact that they're not really listened to anymore so he shifts the debate from being one about transmission being silenced to one of reception not being listened to which i think is a helpful enough idea in some ways so I broadly agree with, with Davies and, and Mishra in, 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 in what they're talking about here. But I think there's something else going on over and above kind of cynical power and position gains up to the idea of cancel culture. Because whenever there is a kind of big controversy or spectacle or event surrounding freedom of speech, one of the things that happens is that politicians and pundits sort of use it as an opportunity to underline why freedom of speech is important. There's a kind of checklist of sacred assumptions and we go through them every time. Free speech is the lifeblood of democracy. The marketplace of ideas produces truth and informs decision making. More speech is the antidote to bad speech. Beware of the slippery slope of restriction and censorship and so on. And it's this desire for constant affirmation that I want to focus on this morning, because I think we can read it in two ways. The first is that this constant doubling down on ideal visions of, of what speech is, how free speech ought to contribute to the democracy, it of course, it's, it's, it's very partial, it's very blinkered, it neglects to account for very obvious changes like the ones we're talking about at this conference. So it has very little to say about the changing shape and impact of communication systems, and by extension, their integration into how politics functions and so on. So we could ask a very obvious question, is more speech really the straightforward democratic sort of response to bad speech when, for example, speech is content produced by machines and formatted as talking points so that we can cut and paste it into Facebook threads and WhatsApps groups and so on. Let's take an example of that uh, on, on, on my right hand side, Elon Musk here and his proposed takeover, this long, now long ongoing saga as to whether he's going to take over Twitter or not. When this deal was first announced, Musk described himself as a free speech absolutist and was critical of moderation and account removal uh, processes and, 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 and procedures in Twitter, particularly in relation to Donald Trump's removal from the platform. And he claimed that he was taking over the platform in order to unlock its free speech potential and therefore to allow all legal speech according to the, the, the remit of that legality in different jurisdictions around the world, which is a massively problematic issue, but I'm not going to go into that precise bit right now, other than to say that this would, of course, immediately make speech very unfree in lots of different countries where governments have shown an appetite to interfere with social media platforms where possible. But let's bracket all of those issues for a moment and just look at something very, very simple, which was a point made by the technolo technology journalist Kate Klonick on National Public Radio when the deal was announced, which is that she said if, if, if he was to do this in the United States, this would mean that all spam needs to stay up. And that's all the spam which would proliferate on this new unmoderated platform. So what would happen, of course, is that rapidly, overnight, it would become functionally unusable. It would render all speech pointless. There'd be no capacity to communicate. So this is the first thing. When we double down on this notion of what free speech is and does, we're obviously missing out on very obvious kinds of changes that tech platforms and the way that they're integrated into public culture organize speech and communication and interaction. So there must be a second way of interpreting this doubling down, and that is to say that it's not an ignorance of these changing media political conditions, but in fact it's a way of refusing them. That is, I think what's going on at the moment is that there's a kind of reanimation of very comforting normative ideas, coordinates of how public should work and contribute to democracy in the face of all evidence that this is not how publics work and democracy in many contexts, neither. Let me take another brief example, which is the character sharing the screen with Elon Musk, who is a, a failed politician, and internet rabble rouser called Rasmus Paludan. Some of you might have, have heard of him. And during April and May of this year, he was responsible for significant unrest and rioting in Malmö, Stockholm, Nordköping, elsewhere in Sweden, because he would turn up there and he would 
attempt to, or he would to burn the Koran and would live stream this to his followers. And this is a stunt he's been playing for, for many years. And every time he does it, it leads to intense social conflict, conflict on the street, intensive political debate, and so on. And so this time in the face of this, of this unrest, the Swedish justice minister, Morgan Johansson, said Sweden is a democracy. And in a democracy, fools also have freedom of speech. And you have to accept that as this is part of living in a democracy. And of course, this is true. This is in some ways uncontroversial. But at the same time, this is a democracy where a party, Stram Kurs, the hardline party set up by, by Paludan, has no electoral significance. It has never crossed the threshold for electoral support. It has 187 Facebook followers. And yet it is regularly able to use a set piece that without fail stokes racism and social conflict. So in some senses, this is an old tactic. It's part Nazis walking through Skokie in Illinois, but also it's a new tactic because it's the live streaming of it, which gives it a whole other dimension and, and intensifies the conflict in very important ways. So the answer to this new mode of political disruption can't simply be we have these timeless national values and that's just how things are. That might be part of the answer, but it certainly can't be the whole one. So what I want to propose in this talk is that we're witnessing in these endless sort of set piece spectacles, conflicts, this rhetoric about freedom of speech, a kind of outbreak of anxiety, an outbreak of anxious normativity. That what happens in these free speech crises is in part a kind of anxious realization that speech doesn't do what we thought it said on the tin. As public and, and, and political communication, speech has kind of slipped away from its normative moorings. It's excessive, it's accelerated, it's dense, and as such it has become a kind of political force in and of itself. It's not just a conduit for politics, it's a political force that we're only beginning to think through and to think about. And I think what's important about this, apart from its real world effects, is that this anxiety, this normative anxiety, is at odds with academic trends in very important ways. So at least in much of the material that I read when we talk about these media or write about these media political environments today, analytically, there's an increased use of ideas of fragmentation or dissonance or polarization. But these descriptions are very much in tension with what's happening in public discourse, this kind of normative yearning. In other words, the experience of these conditions of, of fragmentation and dissonance and polarization is producing a kind of a desire, a renewed commitment for a corrective form of coherence. If only things could be like this, if only speech could work in these ways. So this, I think, is a tension that we need to, to, to deal with. And I think freedom of speech is a very central focus for, for not just this tension, but as I'm going to try to show a lot of other tensions about how we understand contemporary publics. So what I propose to do in the time that I have here is to think through some ways in which this normative anxiety about freedom of speech in the digital media age limits our understandings, and ironically, actually, it perhaps limits our capacities to defend and, and broaden speech and communication as dimensions of human flourishing. And I say this also in a partly self-interested way, because one of the things I've realized since I wrote that book is that for many people, the way that you talk about freedom of speech is that there are only two camps. You are either for it or you are against it. And when you start to think of it as a critical object, you end up, for some people, being against freedom of speech. In other words, there's a very powerful absolutist notion of speech that, when you think about it, has no practical purchase or relevance for understanding communication in our lives. So what I want to start by doing is identifying some tensions in how freedom of speech is understood across academic disciplines and argue for the need for media and communication studies to engage more on this terrain and with these issues, and then move on to two or three examples, seeing, depending on how much time we have, of these tensions at, at, at work. Okay, so fairly uncontroversially, freedom of speech is a, is a, is a central modern imaginary, and discussions of its importance Often are often organized around two kind of broad philosophical lineages. Of course, there's multiple complications to this, but this will do for our, our, our purposes right now. Moral arguments for sort of human autonomy and broadly co consequentialist arguments for the good that speech produces. So you can see this is laid out, this kind of distinction laid out in very textbook ways in, in one of the most recent books written on explaining freedom of speech, quite excellent text by Matteo Bonatti and Jonathan Seglau. 
But when we think about these two dimensions, the kind of deontological notion of, of, of the, moral, the moral right to speak, and then the consequentialist ideas of what speech does, part of the curious debates we have about freedom of speech in contexts where, and I'll qualify this later on, but for now, in contexts where speech rights are not in any sustained or straightforward way under threat, is that we assert the importance of speech morally, the freedom to speak, as we should indeed. And yet in much of the kind of contemporary dramas I've been talking about, it's the consequences of speech that are at stake. It's the consequences of speech that generate anxiety. What does speech contribute in terms of democratic life, in terms of shared understandings, in terms of public knowledge, and so on, under conditions where speech is being transformed in ways that we need to examine. Now, one immediate issue for us in this kind of context is that our dominant academic traditions diverge sharply in it, whether if or in the ways they engage with the idea of free speech or freedom of speech or freedom of expression. For obvious reasons, the concept is centrally associated with legal and philosophical, political philosophical thought, the question of rights and the limits to rights or conflicting rights, um, and normative debates about speech in, in liberal and democratic polities. But as against this, if we take other disciplines that are interested in, yes, communication, but embodied communication, communication and social relationality, theories of mediation, these disciplines find it very, very difficult to engage with the notion of free speech at all. A recent essay in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Anthropology, for example, to quote, argues that freedom of speech has not primarily been considered as a set of lived, valued, and contested practices mediated by various linguistic, ethical, and material forms. While anthropology has not traditionally occupied itself with free speech, it has extensive tools for bringing free speech into view beyond its quality as an abstract ideal or legal category. Now, it's perhaps not a complete surprise that much legal and philosophical thinking about freedom of speech sort of lacks a sustained attention to theories of communication. There's a tendency to take the voice as an expression of conscience and therefore it's a kind of unmediated moral sort of bucket theory of mind, if you like. But it's a little more difficult to understand why freedom of speech has such little purchase in various uh, realms in, in media and communication studies. So for example, let's take two sustained traditions that engage a lot with the kinds of issues we see in freedom of speech debates within media and communication studies. The first is obviously critical political economy. But critical political economy doesn't talk about freedom of speech because it kind of takes up the story at the point where predominantly liberal concepts of free speech leave off. In other words, liberal concepts of free speech is the notion of negative freedom, freedom from coercion, whereas critical political economy then talks about the, 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 the material possibilities and structures that are necessary for communication to be meaningful, a kind of positive freedom model, to put it in very simplistic terms. Similarly, debates on the public sphere, this massive, uh, voluminous literature on the public sphere, substantially overlap with these kind of consequentialist discussions of freedom of speech. In other words, the good that speech does if the public sphere can function in particular kinds of ways. But in, if we take something like a, a kind of iconic article, like Miria Max Ferre and her colleagues' article of four models of the public sphere in modern democracies, they do not write about freedom of speech at all. So the point I want to make here in, a kind, of, in, in kind of disciplinary terms is similar to that of the Cambridge um, anthro anthropology essay in many ways, that media and communication perspectives are now critical to any understanding of what freedom of speech has come to mean under the kinds of conditions we're talking about. And the idea that we use speech as a shorthand for multiple forms of communication is kind of woefully inadequate for understanding the range of ways that people participate in mediated communica communication with democratic intent, for example. So how do we start to work our way into this in, in, in media and communication terms? One thing I think would be to, 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 to start with the ways in which debates about freedom of speech, as, as, as John Durham Peters argues in a wonderful book, Courting the Abyss, he argues that there's a kind of important tension that we need to recognize between the, the normative drive of debates about freedom of speech and the sort of situated, concrete, relational way that we, we might want to approach it when we're thinking about media and communication systems. So he argues that debates about freedom of speech are recursive. 
that what happens to us is that the substantive issue, when something happens, we immediately begin to fit that issue to the principle and what it says about the principle and debate the principle and the concrete conflict or antagonism or, or, or set of issues sort of recedes or becomes secondary to debate about the principle. And this slippage happens, and this is kind of you know, maybe slightly densely theoretical point, but I think it's it's important one. This slippage happens, um, Anshuman Mondal argues, because the way in which speech is conceptualized within liberal theory broadly understood, is he argues it's, under, it's, it's conceptualized as a, a single, what he calls a single homogenous plane of liberty. Imagine an ice skating rink. So we should be free to skate on this rink without any kind of wrinkle or crack in the ice. And the wrinkles and cracks in the ice would be some form of infringement or some form of censorship. But then we skate and we hit the outer buffers and those buffers are law and institutional provision. So that's the model. It's a kind of a flat homogenous plane of liberty, as he argues. But when what, what's very clear is that we don't, in many ways, experience speech as embodied speakers, nor communication in this kind of way. The Australian linguist Nick Reimer makes the point that, to quote, it's a peculiarly modern idea, he argues, that it could make sense to separate speech as such from its content, context and effects in the way that most freedom of speech discussions presuppose. To ignore the difference between different utterances and sweep them indiscriminately up into the catch-all category speech, as we do when we demand freedom for it, is to frame the debate at a level of generality and abstraction that we never actually experience and which therefore should be analytically and politically irrelevant. So from a media and communication studies perspective, taking this linguistic perspective into account, this sort of flat and homogenous plane of liberty is always more complex. It's always more of a topography. It is always one where speech or communication or discourse is never just free or unfree, but where it attempts to flow. It can be blocked and diverted. And there's a more complex map provided by structures, by channels, by institutions of closure, foreclosure, opening. And as we know, we cannot separate the flow of that speech and that discourse and so on from the question of context or form or institution or format or platform. So what I want to argue is without this kind of approach, it becomes very difficult to understand what is happening in the contemporary digital media ecology. And let me turn to an example around social media participation. When we talk about free speech in these very established ways, there's a long standing association for very good reason between the idea of expanding the realm of free expression and the expansion of that realm of free expression, allowing us to, to better pursue knowledge and to better broaden democratic participation. That's still a crucial point. But as we saw with the brief example of Elon Musk and spam, the sheer abundance of communication also does something to this pr presumed relation between expansive communication and expansive freedom. Writing last year in The Guardian, the American political writer and historian Thomas Frank was examining debates in the United States um, in the aftermath of the attack on, on Capitol Hill, on fake news and post-truth and din disinformation and the role and responsibility of social media platforms. Now, there's many things in this article, I think, which were interesting. He's very skeptical of simply political appeals to the civic responsibility of unaccountable platforms and tech giants and so on. And he's also very hostile to what he saw as the diagnosis of an information disorder, which he argues is to legitimate sort of very technocratic solutions. And what this does, he argued, I think, very persuasively, is it brings back a kind of lingering elitist fear of the masses, that the masses can't quite handle their freedom, they quite, can't quite handle their communicative freedom. But the problem for Frank, or the problem in his argument, is that then he to core, he, he, he pushes away any discussion of platform management as what he calls a rush for censorship. And of course, what he's ignoring here is that speech on social media platforms is only free insofar as it circulates as data gathering and data producing content. Now, as we know, individual, individual participation or individual use 
of, of or expression on a platform like Twitter is governed by user agreements, by algorithmic sorting, and often by very unfathomable moderation and content removal practices. So speech on platforms can only occur under these conditions and in the interests of advancing forms of what Jordana Zuboff calls corporate surveillance capitalism. But for Thomas Frank, when he, in, in thinking about freedom of speech on Twitter, Twitter can only either be this homogenous plane of liberty or it can act as a censor. And so what he does is he treats all content that does not break the law, all content that does not incite violence, for example, as evidence of liberty and thus as a natural extension of the marketplace of ideas. And in the marketplace of ideas, the remedy for bad speech, of course, is nothing other than more speech. Now, in the US context, this kind of First Amendment absolutism has deep resonance, as of course many of you know. So much so that Philip M. Napoli, in his 2018 study of what he terms First Amendment theory meets fake news in the filter bubble, entitles his study very tentatively, what if more speech is no longer the solution under these kinds of conditions where you know, speech is essentially produced by machines and so on. Now, while this marketplace of ideas metaphor has rather less purchase outside of the United States, the idea that more speech is the democratic remedy is also widely held, is widely held, I think, outside of the United States too. But what does more speech involve in a context where social media platforms are predicated on extracting more and more speech from us? The problem, as Richard Seymour argues in his 2019 book, The Twittering Machine, is that an often unremarked aspect of our experience of communicative abundance on social media or online is what he calls scripturience, that is the incessant desire and demand to write, to write into the machine. The digital media ecosystem, he argues, has re-industrialized writing. It provides us with, quote, a machine to write to. The twittering machine, in his argument, is not just, to quote, the infrastructure of fiber optic cables database servers, storage systems, software, and code. It is the machinery of writers and writing and the feedback loop they inhabit. In other words, speech as the production of content is being cultivated not only as data, but as a form of drive, a structured consumer compulsion. And this has many consequences, but for now we can conclude on this point with this that an undifferentiated notion of speech, such as the one used here by Thomas Frank, that encompasses every mode of mediated communication. And that is followed by a kind of grim determination that all speech must be free so that it will find a way to deliver the good. This kind of understanding acts as a blockage to, under, to, 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 to thinking through, I think, these complex public dynamics and their very ambivalent democratic impacts and potentials. Let me make one last point before we move to a discussion. And it's something I think which may, may have a resonance or might have a resonance with many people, which is to look at the ways in which freedom of speech and academic freedom have over last years been put into conflict with each other. They're in conflict, I think, with each other in substantive, meaningful ways, but they've also been put into conflict with each other in very uh, profoundly manufactured and politicized ways also. As my kind of fleeting appearance on, on Fox, Fox News there at the start illustrates, it's probably a surprise to nobody here, the extent to which academic research, disciplinary curricula, university contexts are, are under attack. Um, these operations are highly sophisticated in the United States, of course, but this is also a massively significant issue um, with a variety of teams and actors at play in, in, the United, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, in the Nordic countries, and many other contexts. I, I was at a gender studies conference in Copenhagen last week, for example, that required security passes. Such was the, the enthusiasm of not just sort of online right-wing trolls, but also mainstream journalists to turn up at the conference, take things out of context, and you know, deliver some red meat to their, to their, to their readership or to their followers in that way. Now, there's a wide spectrum of things going on, I think, in this current attack on universities in different contexts. But I want to focus or try to pull out one issue which pertains to this discussion of how we understand freedom of speech. To a large extent, freedom of speech in public discourse or academic freedom, or let's let's start there, is understood as either a variation on or an extension of freedom of speech. However, as we know, when we think about how academic speech operates in institutional contexts, or as 
for example, Robert Post has argued on, on this point at, at length over the last years. Academic freedom is not merely an extension of freedom of speech into the space of the university. Very often, it acts in contradiction to freedom of speech. The reason for this is that the, the mission of, to put it somewhat grandly, let's take a slightly idealized form of the university for now, rather than the, 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 the sort of institutions that, that, that many people are, are striving to try and do their best in at the moment. But the mission of the university in teaching and research is dependent proactively on endorsing forms of closure. That is, we discriminate when we put together a curricula, when we invite speakers, when we read each other's work or read students' work, we enact forms of closure. We discriminate between ideas on the basis of, of received wisdom, disciplinary norms, intellectual expertise, and so on. And in doing this, we foreground some ideas while actively neglecting and marginalizing those that have been discredited or disproven, and so on. So as Robert Post argues, again, in, in, a, in a very sort of US centric framing, the academic freedom is a qualitatively different set of communicative norms from, to quote, the egalitarian tolerance that defines the marketplace of ideas paradigm of the First Amendment. Now, this question of closure is a key dilemma in philosophical discussions of freedom of speech. J.S. Mill, for example, has written, written quite significantly on this in terms of the sort of the value of heterodox ideas and the way that heterodox ideas prevent orthodox, prevent received ideas from sort of calcifying into orthodoxy and losing their value and so on. And this notion of closure is very central to theorizations of the public sphere and so on and so forth. But my question at, in this example is what does closure mean in a digital media ecology which is predicated on, on, on circulation, predicated on maximal openness to a certain extent? Let me take one example of the conflicts that emerge from this, and it's a, a, a recent sort of prominent, prominent controversies over the notion of view, so-called viewpoint diversity. And the notion of viewpoint diversity um, lays very explicit claim to free speech heritage. It lays very explicit claim to a consequentialist free speech heritage, whereby democratic health and human progress stem from a maximal exchange of opinion, and therefore you cannot rule out any opinion simply arbitrarily. We must allow all of the opinions to circulate in order to be able to continually reach the best ideas. However, in a recent essay, an American anthropologist, Carolyn Moxley Rose, is looking at this debate and reviews the original mission statement of a, a viewpoint diversity website called the Heterodox Academy. And she notes that they, they talk about the need to question questionable orthodoxies, which is fair enough, of course, but those questionable orthodoxies that they're most interested in have something in common. Um, they're all about, in the end of the day, they're mostly all about race. So to quote her, the list of questionable orthodoxies provided by the website is revealing in that it aligns so closely with 19th and 20th century natural sciences, which brought us polygenism, eugenics, and beliefs about the indelible connections among, ra among race, IQ, and behavior. If the Heterodox Academy were truly excavating academic orthodoxies, why not include in their list utilitarian economic theory or modernization theory or American democracy? Instead, the authors cast sociobiology, racist culture of poverty theories and social prejudice as somehow falling victim to liberal orthodoxy in the, Euro in, in the university. Now, what Roos is demonstrating here is that these narrow fixations of kind of viewpoint diversity debates in this instance are an attempt to do something very precise. They're an attempt to recuperate racialized knowledge as nothing more than an exercise in free thinking, as thought experiments that increase the reasonable plurality of the public sphere through thinking and speaking freely. However, these are ideas, of course, that have been largely foreclosed in universities through academic and also, of course, through political, but through processes of scrutiny and selection and debate. So the often very well-funded and organized internet activists that keep university under university curricula and university staff and university publications under surveillance, they do something very specific. They treat the forms of closure that come from the practice of academic freedom as arbitrary limitation, as ideological barriers to considering heterodox ideas. In other words, they argue academic freedom as a privilege is being used to limit freedom of speech, where the former is presented as nothing more than an extension of the latter.
And so through these logics of digital surveillance and circulation of, of material, activists can try to lay claim to the iconoclastic heritage of free speech struggles. But they do this basically to wage a war on very familiar fronts, migration and multiculturalism, racial discrimination, gender and feminism and sexuality, colonialism and nationalism and so on. And what it amounts to is a politics of endless disruption presented as a commitment to free thinking, whereby everything can and should be open and opened up again and again and again. And of course, this endless opening up again and again is the very sort of lifeblood of the circulation of discourse in a media economy, where people are competing intensively for attention and where social media, as we know, the model, the business model is predicated on the production and circulation of opinion and reaction, opinion and reaction, and so on. So the point is this, that while academic freedom works in many ways through processes of closure, there is no closure in a system of digital circulation, where the same talking points, the same stereotypes, the same discredited theories, the same mythologies, the same memes can constantly keep demanding engagement, debate, dialogue, discourse all the time. And while this is only part of the picture, there's a real structuring tension here that renders universities liable to what they're being charged with in many contexts right now, which is that they do not foster or protect freedom of speech through arbitrary forms of closure on what free speech is taken to involve and taken to mean. There are other examples, but I'm going to, to end there. As I noted in opening, these are sort of sketches, these points, they're ideas towards thinking about why the idea of free speech is in the first instance infused with such anxiety in the moment in terms of abundant speech or abundant communication. And that yet in some of its most dominant political, academic, public understandings, it's very ill-equipped or ill-equips us to think about what's happening to speech under these conditions. And I think as well, what I've tried to show is in fact, it's very ill-equipped to demonstrate to us the forms of unfreedom, which can also be produced by abundant communication and abundant speech. Thank you. So we are going to do similar to what we did yesterday. So for those of you online that might have a question, feel free to raise your hand. If you have a question here in the room, you'll have to come down here. So I'm sorry, so that Gavin can hear you. So I don't know if anyone wants to be the first brave person to do that <laughs> or someone in the in the chat as well. Um, but just let me know. Yep, sorry, we've got something down. Just one moment. So thank you, very interesting speech. I was a little bit taken aback uh, to hear the absence of the location of, uh, of the object of your study. Um, but you did at one time uh, talk about and use the word uh, US-centric framing. And certainly I would say that you gave a, a kind of US-centric framing in a way that at least in the initial part of the uh, talk seemed to me to be a little bit confusing. Uh, and I'm not sort of wanting to insist on a, on a particular kind of uh, location for oneself, but uh, as an Irish man speaking from an Irish institution, I was expecting something that might have informed me about the questions of free speech in Ireland. Uh, rather than this uh, quite curious conflation of free speech as a kind of global concept, which ultimately you kind of backed away from, and yet still wanted to go back to the United States. And as someone who lives in the United States and is an anti active anti-imperialist, uh, I'm concerned, uh, and I'll be interested in your answer, in your comment, but I'm concerned that you know this idea of just presenting free speech as a universally understood concept is, uh, is clearly uh, comprehended as a sort of universal notion when, in, of course, for example, the US uh, Constitution and Bill of Rights and free speech claims are uniquely American. But why should they be exactly applied everywhere else in the same way? Uh, part of the issue seems to be that uh, this is a kind of imperial 
an unselfconscious imperial uh, kind of approach that really uh, could, could be uh, uh, enriched by uh, a much more uh, self-conscious uh, critical approach uh, that located the question of free speech in specific national contexts or even in an EU context versus uh, a, uh, a US context or uh, some other kind of context. So I was, I'm concerned about the particular uh, particularities of location for free speech. And I have to say, uh, as, a, as an Australian who lives in the United States, uh, you want to talk about free speech, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed you didn't uh, mention uh, Julian Assange, who is a classic uh, example of the dilemma, if you like, of uh, applying free speech in one context and then colliding with the American imperial uh, demands and obsessions in another. So I'll, I'll leave it with that and let you go wherever you like. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, you know, if you expect an Irish person to speak only about Ireland in the context of university research, I'm, I'm not sure what I can do with, with that kind of reductive uh, and somewhat essentialist assumption. Um, but the point about location is, is, is well made in some ways, I think, um, in that quite obviously, if we need, if we want to think about some of the issues that I, that, that I flagged in the beginning, about the only understanding speech in concrete terms through institutions and social relationality and media systems, then quite clearly um, we could do this another way, which is we could take a number of examples from particular situations, particular contexts, and work them through, including perhaps, for example, uh, the, 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 the Assange case. Um, the decision to use primarily um, North American examples was the exigencies of giving a talk like this, having a look at the people who are in the room and trying to find, uh, in so much as one can, when one isn't in the room, trying to find points of commonality or points of reference for an academic uh, audience. But I think in applying a very sort of homogenizing notion of imperialism to what I'm what I was talking about here, it misses the ways in which it is not a universal notion of freedom of speech which circulates, it is a universalized notion of freedom of speech which circulates, and it circulates and is used across polities that have very, very different institutional provisions, legal uh, frameworks, and histories of organizing freedom of speech in ways that speak to the kinds of problems I'm looking at here. Let me give you an example. The far right in Finland um, in 2018, campaigned for the presidential election on the basis of the need to defend freedom of speech in Finland. They did this in a country which is always ranked in the top three of the Press Freedom Index and in many other similar sort of civil liberties indexes around the world. The only thing which makes that, reson that resonate politically is the borrowing, uh, the, the translation into that context of a notion of freedom of speech, which is taken from a sort of cultural misunderstanding or cultural romanticization of, of, of First Amendment, um, of the First Amendment as, as, as allowing for maximalist or all kinds of speech, and using that to insist on a particular kind of political positioning and political platforming in a country where if we were to look at freedom of speech in, 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 in judicial, or institutional, or media legislative ways is highly provided for in that context. Similarly, the example that I gave in, in, in Sweden and Norway and Denmark of Rasmus Paladin, this is an action which is based on this universalized notion that freedom of speech must mean speech without limits. And it is one which has been backed up and one which has been reified in the public spheres of those countries in ways which have, I think, you know, led to very, very, very significant debates about what freedom of speech means in contexts that have particular heritages of how speech is understood vis-a-vis -vis this more transnational notion. So I think it's a mistake to see anything transnational as being simply, you know, uh, a sort of, of reluctance to name imperialism. I don't think there's an imperialism involved in this. There's certainly an Americanization to some extent of notions of freedom of speech, but it's not as simple as that. And it's certainly not as simple as the notion that this is pushed from a core to a periphery. Rather, this notion of freedom of speech 
under these conditions is allowing a variety of different kinds of actors to perform particular kinds of politics. And it's the reasons why they can perform that often with such kind of devastating precision and effect that I was trying to look at in this speech. Anyone else have a question in the room? I'll let me double check the chat that I'm not missing anyone there as well. Someone coming down with a question. Thanks, Michael. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. I was a professor in Texas when Texas passed a law allowed open carry of firearms on campuses. And then once again in Colorado, USA, when again, the state legislature passed a law allowing uh, firearms on campus. So in mentioning how there are different modes of speech acts, my, my curiosity is in the United States context, sorry, mm -hmm. um, uh, how are we considering uh, the brandishing of firearms or the use of firearms as a mechanism of free speech. And, you know, the First and Second Amendment being paired next to each other, it seems like the Second Amendment has started to bleed into the First Amendment in this, like, ability to openly um, demonstrate with firearms, openly uh, acknowledge that you are a firearm aficionado. I have a student, for example, who wore a, an American flag that was made out of, like, AK-47s and ar 15s and then uh, there was a, a stipulation to the law that said you're not allowed to openly admit that you have a firearm in class, but he went as far as to say, I know I'm not supposed to say it, but let's just say if somebody walked into this room, I can take care of it, right? So, so I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on like how things like uh, gun ownership have, have sort of led into this conversation on the book, maybe, maybe especially in context of academic freedom. Thanks. Yeah, it's 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 a really in, it's a really interesting one, and and one obviously that I'm far less qualified than than you to comment on. But I, I think what what might one way of, of of looking at the connection that you're making is that one of the reasons that I spoke um, so exclusively about understandings of speech is I think that when in debates about freedom of speech, there's a lot of debates about what constitutes freedom. So it's very much about, you know, what is what is my right to vis-a-vis -vis your right not to be subjected to something else. So these are very sort of classical dilemmas. But there's less discussion about speech, right? So kind of theory, a theory of communication. So obviously at a communications conference, that's where my, my emphasis was. But I think when it comes to what you're talking about, it, it is helpful to flip back because in the same way as that speech has become understood as sort of maximalist, ex maximalist expression um, without thinking of the content, without thinking of the consequences or that to think of content and think of consequences is to somehow denigrate the notion of freedom of speech. Um, in the same way, the idea of freedom, which is has become the sort of the, 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 the ballast of this notion, is a notion of freedom. We, we can see this like Wendy Brown has written about this, this recently, which is a sort of deeply re reactionary notion of freedom, which has two dimensions. One is that there should be no restrictions um, on my individual capacities to express myself in, in whatever way that might be, not just legally, but if you like, in, in, including the social contract, including the very relationality of, of, of living in society with others. And that is a second, so there's a fear of, of, of kind of loss, you know, that I'm losing this. But that notion of loss is very, very closely related to a, a kind of accusation of theft. I'm losing this freedom because somebody else is taking it from me, which of course is how the kind of construction of enemies of freedom proceeds. So I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about, about, about open carry in any kind of way, but it is, of course, as you say, absolutely imperative to connect questions of freedom of speech and academic freedom to the fact that somebody can have a firearm with them in, in, in the classroom. It's absolutely impossible to conceive of somebody speaking freely under those conditions. But of course, one of the things that I think is, is that has struck me about debates about freedom of speech is that sort of hypocrisies or, or, or double standards like this are not, we can, we, can, we can point them out, but they don't really do anything much to, to, to dent the kind of ideological projects or desires, which are more than happy to hold these two things together, which is that my freedom to carry a firearm in the classroom very obviously impinges on your freedom to speak, which is the other bumper sticker that I have um, on, my, on my school bag, you know? So yeah, 
Morning. I was late, so if you already discussed this, I apologize. I'm just wondering where Carl Popper's uh, paradox of tolerance fits within your framework of what you discussed today. Yeah, no, I, I definitely didn't discuss uh, Carl Carl Popper's paradox of of tolerance. I mean. I suppose that paradox of tolerance is is simply never far away from these discussions. I'm I'm not sure what point I would be you know best place to to kind of stitch it in and and open it out open it out further. I mean I think that there is I think there's a there's a very particular way in which the notion of tolerance is 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 deployed in 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 a lot of these debates which is that and it, it can partly be traced to to popper but not but but not only um which is that tolerance is a kind of a a civilizational virtue and that it's a prime civilizational virtue and therefore rather than you know thinking about the kind of Popper's paradox in the in the immediate aftermath of 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 the Second World War, and I think, you know, it would be instructive to us to go back not just to Popper but to Sartre and to others who, who wrote about similarly try to to get at this at this paradox in relation to fascist discourse in the aftermath of of and fascist politics in the aftermath of the Second World War. The, the paradox is one of you know how do you tolerate that which would destroy the conditions that allow you to tolerate? How do you tolerate that which would destroy you? But I think that there's a kind of way in which, because we, we I say this broadly, because there's a certain amount of kind of complacency about um, the strength of, of our democratic institutions and procedures and so forth, that the test has become one of how much can we tolerate, that the strength of a democracy is in how much it can tolerate. And, and one of the books that I talked about there, John Durham Peters' book, Courting the Abyss, writes about this very eloquently and he calls it the development of what he calls a kind of homeopathic machismo that is the idea that a little bit of what's bad for you strengthens you know your sort of civic character and strengthens the overall body politic and so on but when we look at the kinds of 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 tensions that i was trying to lay out there between sort of internet activism of a certain kind in the university what this tolerance is used to do is to stretch the kind of boundaries that someone like Popper or others had in mind. So for example, uh, materials which are openly Holocaust denying materials are increasingly proposed in different contexts as, as worthy of study, worthy of engagement. Why? Because we have to be the most democratic, be the most tolerant and show that we can engage with and are not scared of arguments and don't drive them underground and all of this kind of thing. And that strikes me as profoundly a mistake, not just ethically, but also because it misunderstands the kinds of knowledge production relations that I was trying to talk about in, in that example. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time today, Gavin. Um, you certainly left us a lot to think about and discuss as we move on to the next session and coffee break in parallel sessions today. So I'm sure we'll continue the conversation um, both here in person and those people online as well. So if everyone just join me and thank you, Gavin. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good conference. Thanks.